Well, welcome again, everybody. Um, as you know, today's webinar is about the benefits and applications of semi-adiabatic calorimetry. And um, for those who have maybe listened in to our other webinars or have participated in some user conferences, you will notice that we, we generally put a lot of emphasis on isothermal calorimetry. And we often treat semi-adiabatic calorimetry a little bit as a stepchild. Uh, and it's not really fair for the technique because it's a technique that's quite powerful and has some advantages, especially, especially for concrete labs and for field work. And so today is, uh, is probably the first time we, uh, we go a little bit more in detail. Now, a lot of the users uh, or the participants today, I, I've seen are already users of this technique. So some of it will certainly sound familiar to you as I go through it. But feel free to interject and ask questions. You can do so by just typing a question in the chat box. And I'm sure Jeff will pick them up along the way and then uh, infuse them into this discussion so we can have something a little bit more dynamic than just me going through the slides. So if you have questions, just interject. We can uh, go through them as we uh, as we go into into the presentation. So uh, first things first, uh, what uh, what is an, uh, an a semi-adiabatic calorimeter and how are these things designed? So the the design of a semi-adiabatic calorimeter uh, calorimeter is uh, at the very core something extremely simple. It is uh, as you see on the right hand side, it's a piece of thermal insulation you know, to try to be as good as possible. Uh, with a sample container where you will put your sample, of course, and a temperature sensor, and then data gets collected one way or another uh, by uh, by data logger usually, and then you can can look at the data in in different formats. Uh, this, this setup is a setup that uh, is widely used already. In fact, uh, while traveling the world and looking at different types of uh, users and, and and things that people do, I stumbled across more than one time. Uh, people that just have a thermometer in their hands and take a measurement every five minutes and literally put it on a sheet of paper, which is the cheapest form of a, of a semi-adiabatic calorimeter, piece of insulation, sample, thermometer, and a pen and paper. But you, you could actually go along and get some meaningful results even with that. That brings out one of the principal advantages of semi-adiabatic calorimetry versus isothermal calorimetry is that it's, it's pretty cheap. Price of thermal calorimetry, so you can get something at a reasonable price uh, um, and quickly be operational with it. So as you put the setup uh, together, you will notice well with the insulation, the heat is trapped. It's uh, it's produced in a sample and then it's retained as much as possible, so that the temperature sensor, usually either thermocouple or a thermistor, can can capture the temperature from there. Uh, so there's there's no great great science to it and I'm sure many of you have seen different types of setups for this type of uh, apparatus. What you get out of that is uh, here again a simple temperature curve. It's temperature that you get over time. And uh, as you look at that in, in this typical temperature curve that you would get for uh, Portland cement based concrete, you would get, I would say, four main parts that you would look at. Part A, when you look at the graph, is the initial peak. Now, this initial peak corresponds, in theory, to the aluminate reaction that uh, from the cement hydration, the early part of the reaction. In practice, in a semi-adiabatic calorimeter, you very rarely see that, if ever. So I want to say that more than nine times out of ten, you will not see it, uh, just because when you mix your concrete, just the friction from the mixing, the temperature that goes up, the, the noise of temperature in the lab, different materials at different temperatures, gives you something, a bump there that is hard to tell what it actually is. So while you will see, for example, on the ASTM C1753, that in theory this peak is visible, you really would have to have a very tight experimental setup to hope to see something. I would not count on it, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a big issue because most of the characteristics we want to look at are, are not related to this illuminate peak. And if you really were to uh, need one or to see it, then uh, you could always use an isothermal calorimeter. Then in B, you have the dormant phase. The dormant phase is, as you all know, is when not much happens. This is when you transport your concrete, when you do all sorts of things where, where you don't want the reaction yet to occur. And of course, you can manipulate the length of the dormant phase, the duration of it, with admixtures and other means. Then uh, part C is when you have the climb, the climb towards the uh, hydration. And this, this climb tells you a lot, actually. The steeper it is, 
the closer you will get your initial set time to your final set time and the faster the reaction occurs. So this is something that you will usually like to look at when you look at a semi-adiabatic calorimetry curve. Then D, D is uh, the main peak. And in that main peak, you would look uh, at how wide it is and how, how far up, how tall this peak is. Now, when you look at this curve uh, in individually, at one single curve, you don't see much. Uh, in semi-adiabatic calorimetry, as is the case with other calorimetry too, the, the power in the, the, the technique re resides in the comparison you can make between different mixes. So you look at relative performance of different, and usually the, the experimental setup that you would have in its simplest form would be to use a control. We have a control mix, and then you change one parameter at a time. For example, um, the, the substitution rate of an SCM, or uh, you could think you have a, a control mix, and then you, you incrementally add some admixture, and look how this curve evolved. So, uh, and that's an important part to, uh, to derive from that, is that individual curves don't tell you much. In a calorimetry experiment, you should always think about comparing several curves, one, curves one to another. So the way this works, uh, you can get two types of information in this. And here, I, on purpose, I put two curves. And this is actually, uh, they are, of course, all real curves. They're not fabricated. This is an example where the, the green curve is a mix where, uh, where we used reclaimed water. So as you know, there's, there's reclaimers in the concrete industry where you dump in your leftover concrete, and then you can put it to sleep for a while, and you, you can reclaim the materials. And part of what you can reclaim is the water. And so the, the green mix has reclaimed water uh, as the, the water source, uh, the hydration, and then the yellow mix has normal city water. So on the left-hand side, you see the, the temperature curve. The temperature curve actually gives you a view of reaction kinetics. So what is reaction kinetics? It's the measure of instantaneous speed of the reaction. So how quickly it evolves at any point in time. If it goes very quick, very violently, it tells you something, most notably, it tells you something about setting times. On the right-hand side, it's a different type of curve. It's actually, it's the cumulative temperature, in this case measured in temperature times time, and it would be the integral of the curve you see on the left. So it, it would mean it's the surface area uh, along the time scale, it's the surface area underneath the curves on the left. And with that cumulative temperature, it doesn't tell you anything about instantaneous speed of the reaction. It tells you about the total extent of the reaction, how much of the total reaction has taken place, or if you want, the total distance traveled in a way. So it gives a, a sense uh, in calorimetry uh, of uh, relative strength gain, for example. So it's also often something that is, uh, that is useful. So uh, when you need, uh, when you do some testing, you generally look for some standard guidelines, especially when you do it for the first time, uh, or, or you're early, uh, an early user of that. You, you look for some place where you can find how to actually proceed, so things about what type of apparatus you, you use, how to design an experiment, uh, how to look at data. And all that a few years ago was very scarce. There was not much available, a few papers here and there. But uh, ever since we had ASTM C1753, that was a team effort led by Tim Cost, who back then was working at Holsen. Uh, ever since then, we actually now have a document that has pretty much everything you need. So for those who have not seen it yet or don't have it yet, I would encourage you to get it and just look through it and, and read it at least once, because you get most of what you need on the design of uh, the apparatus. If you to design your own or if you if you buy one commercially you want to know that it's uh, good enough what you try to do it tells you uh, how, how to go about experimental setup what kind of materials to use how to weigh them how to go about it typical ASTM stuff and it tells you uh, about a few examples of applications and data interpretation so it's a valuable tool and we should all have a look at it so the, the takeaways from that standard uh, oversimplified because of course there's way more in there is that uh, first of all most designs of semi-diabetic calorimeters work uh, these designs are quite forgiving but you do not need to buy uh, a more expensive 
commercial apparatus, you can very well go about and make your own. While at Calmetrix, we sell such a device. If you make your own, nobody will be mad at you. I think it's totally fair to try and, and build your own. And uh, as per the standard, generally it will comply. You, you will see later in the presentation that actually the trick of that is not so much this simple setup of having a temperature sensor uh, and a little bit of insulation. It's about how can you design the apparatus to make it easy to use on a day to day so that you actually want to use it and you don't in your conscience walk away from it because it's so complicated to use. But most designs work. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a signal to noise ratio of at least five. Uh, that's defined in the standard as uh, the signal of the active sample is the amplitude of the curve of the active sample curve divided by the amplitude of a sample curve from an inert material, like a sand sample. As long as you reach an app, a ratio of five between those two, you're good. Uh, that again is not very complicated to achieve. And uh, the standard also said that you will get much better results by conditioning the materials to the same temperatures in the lab. Very often when you take uh, the materials for your concrete mix, you take maybe aggregates that have been baking in the sun, take city water, it might be a little colder, and you mix all that together and you get a temperature that is very different from the temperature in your lab and for extension in, in your uh, apparatus. So you would get an early curve that is, is a little twisted and it's not exactly, uh, it doesn't exactly give you the, the data that you look for. So you get better results if you condition the materials and in the standard you will see there are certain guidelines for that too. And uh, the standard also insists, there's just a, as I said earlier, that you would look at relative performance between several mixes. You would not try to interpret uh, absolute data in a curve. It doesn't make much sense. And then the standard tells you that you should use the fractions method to assess set times. So I, I myself have worked for uh, uh, Grace, the admixture company, uh, quite a long while back now. It's now called DCP Advanced Technologies. And we, we have used this fractions method even long before the standard. So I, I can say confidently that it's very robust and it works. And I'll get to that later and show you what the fractions method means for those who are not familiar with it. So let's think a little bit about typical applications uh, that you have of a, uh, of a semi-adiabatic calorimeter. And those typical uh, applications are quite wide, actually, in scope. There's a lot of things you can do. A few are listed there. A few of the ones that you see quite often are in the bullet points below. So you you would use it to determine uh, dosage, for example, and time of addition for admixtures. It's useful when you do your mix design. Uh, you could check uh, for potential cement admix uh, or cement SCM admixture interactions when materials don't get along very well. Because as we all know, those mixes are getting complicated. There's lots of materials. Uh, you can be sure that uh, admixture providers, uh, cement suppliers have not tested all the possible combinations. So things happen. It's a good idea to put things in the calorimeter because the calorimeter actually shows you a continuous curve of the reaction. It's not like set time or compressive strength testing that gives you one data point or a couple of data points. Here you have a continuous curve where you really see how the mix evolves and it's easy to compare different cement admixture mixes and to see uh, if there's an interaction that's adverse or not. Look at the robustness of a mix. Uh, very often you should probably ask yourself the question, what happens if something goes wrong? If we accidentally overdose uh, the admixture? If someone, uh, if a truck driver throws something in there, throws a little bit more than what he should, uh, what, what happens if uh, there's a variation in my fly ash? So you, it's a very easy to use tool when you use semi-adiabatic calorimetry to be able to test that. You can, of course, do mix design and select the best materials for your mix. Uh, you can also determine setting times uh, without doing the physical testing, uh, which is often, and it's a blessing when, when you know that physical testing or setting time might be quite labor intensive. So it's, often the blessing to be able to do this with just pure calorimetry. And again, it's visually very easy to interpret these things. And then, uh, of course, you can, uh, for those who are in admixture development, they, they do know that for sure, 
that when you have a very large test matrix, when you try to look at different formulations of admixtures with different raw materials and try it with different cements, you very quickly get test matrices that are huge. 150 different tests that you have to do. And doing physical testing for all that is very cumbersome. So calorimetry is, is an excellent screening tool uh, to narrow those matrices down to, uh, to a few winning combinations. It's a very powerful tool to use, and as I said, relatively cost-effective. Then last but not least, you, you can use it to troubleshoot issues in the field. I've seen that uh, there's, uh, there's several uh, people that work in the mobile concrete lab at the FHWA that joined today, so they, they sure know that uh, you can use semi-adiabatic calorimetry to troubleshoot issues in the field on any kind of job, shaving job or other jobs. What, what do we have that's actually available today um, commercially? Well, there's, there's actually not much. For some odd reason, uh, there's, there's not many devices that you can buy off the shelf, uh, or maybe there are, and I'm not aware of them, but uh, there's, of course, ours. There's a CalMetrics current model that we sell is the FCAL 8100. It has eight sample cells, uh, each for a three by six inch uh, concrete cylinder. Uh, that, that is the model that we currently have on our shelves for sale. Uh, in the past, we had the FCAL 4000 and 8000. This has been discontinued and replaced by the newer model. Uh, before that, there was a precursor of all that was the Grace Adiacal system. And there's still quite a few out there that I know that people are using. Getting a little old, but as I said, it's, everything's forgiving here and it works quite well. At some point, there was a Calmetrix PCAL. It was a one cell equipment a little bit more adiabatic, better insulated, also has been discontinued. We have, uh, we have a bunch of homemade coffee cup versions that I see, and they all work. They, uh, they do what they're supposed to do. So you see a couple of pictures here in insulating chamber or not, or just on the table with coffee cups and sensors in there. So this is what, what's out there today. Uh, now, when you do your own, you have to think about a few things. As I said earlier, all these designs work reasonably well, and you will derive results that work quite well. You have to ask yourself, well, is it worth buying a commercial type of equipment or not? And sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So I, I'm listing here mainly uh, those things that you will not necessarily get with your homemade equipment and that you could maybe need, maybe not. Uh, the quality of insulation, Evidently, with your coffee cup version, you, you won't get much. You could always add some, uh, of course, and, and not have it like on the table, like the setup on the picture, but a little bit more elaborate. But in the most basic version, you would not get the quality of insulation. The resolution and response time of a data logger, you could get access to that. There's plenty of data loggers available that you can purchase that would fit the bill. Uh, accuracy of the temperature sensors, yes, but in the setup on the right hand side, the fact that those temperature sensors are vertically inserted inside inside the sample, you just place them at a slight angle, and some of them are closer to the edge of the cup than, than others, and you get a very poor reproducibility or repeatability with that. So you have to think about that. If reproducibility is important, you, you should probably get a better setup. And there's software. Uh, if you don't have a software that's easy to use, it can become very cumbersome. Just extract raw data, transfer it into Excel, uh, run a macro to, it's a lot of work because it's repeat work. You do it every day, it gets old after a while. So you should think about the software part. Then of course, the overall ease of the setup when you have uh, lots of cables going around and it also is something that's a little bit of a put off when you have to do this every day several times. And the portability to take it into the field. Uh, the setup on the right hand side is a little difficult to take into the field. I'm listing those. I don't want it to sound like a sales pitch that you absolutely need to buy what we have. Uh, I, I'm listing those by saying if some of those are important, you should think. You should think is there a better way? Uh, if all of the ones that I listed and are crossed out here in red are not so important, then I insist that still the coffee cup setup will get you results and will you'll be able to, to make that work. You'll absolutely be able to uh, exploit the, uh, the results in your daily work. So, uh, 
if I look at this in a way, uh, what's the biggest bang for the buck? If you had to invest into something by doing your homemade version uh, where, where you would get the best results for it, my recommendation would be that you look for the best possible insulation. Um, to illustrate that, I have here a few curves that show the same exact same sample, but in different devices. And as you see, the green curve is on in our most recent device, the FPL 8100, that has very good insulation. And you say that you get quite a good signal. Uh, and the precursor to that, our FPL 8000, uh, had a slightly not so good insulation, uh, not as good as the one we have now. And that's the yellow curve. And you have the gray Adiacal is the was an early version as well, so it doesn't make it bad. It was just there before, and we didn't know everything we know today. So that would be the red curve, and then on the bottom you would have the coffee cup version. So it, it is less important when you have mixes with lots of cement in there, but the more substitution you have with more inert materials or with materials that have a prosolanic reaction that comes later on, the more it becomes important to have this, this better signal to noise ratio that you don't necessarily have. Uh, today. So I would say invest in good insulation and you will not regret it. And the other thing I would invest in is some sort of software. Either you have someone program it for you or you, you find a commercial version that you can use with your data logger. It makes it easy to extract and plot data the way you want. Because uh, when you take that data and you take a minute, uh, a data point every minute and you do it for 48 hours, it becomes long files of long lines and Manip manipulating them in Excel or another spreadsheet tool, uh, do this every day five times or six times, and after a while, it doesn't feel like it's very motivating to use this apparatus anymore. So I would invest in a good software. And in fact, we, we do have a software applications for those who want to do their, their homemade application, uh, their homemade device, and uh, it's, which is called Thermocal Light. And if you ever are in need of something like that, give us a call. It's uh, while well, we charge for it, it's not exorbitant. And so uh, it, it works with not all data loggers, but with some. And we we sure have that ready so that people can use more semi adiabatic calorimetry and do not get stopped by the particular price of a commercially available device. With that said, uh, I want to get into some examples of uh, data interpretation, a few of them. Mark, yeah, Mark. Uh, just uh, can you go back to that slide before? I don't think you uh, pointed out the baseline, did you? Maybe I missed it. Black. Yeah, sure, sure. So I I, I missed that. I, I pointed out uh, yes on the bottom of those curves, the black curve is truly really, uh, was hardly visible to me. Is indeed I added here what uh, what a baseline curve is of an inert sample, so it gives you sense. Uh, so indeed, if you look at the amplitude. It's, it's so small here that you cannot really measure it. I would have to zoom in. But the amplitude between the lowest point and the highest point of this uh, noise curve or baseline curve on the bottom is, is, is this small amount here. And, uh, I show by uh, moving the cursor. And uh, it has to be uh, in the, the ratio for of, of the amplitude of this curve, let's say the blue curve here, has to be at least five times the amplitude that you have on the black curve. So you see that even with the uh, coffee cup setup, you reach that easily. So you would be in compliance with the standard. But as I said, the compliance with the standard is not always good enough. Uh, these curves here, that's just a plain Portland cement. There's nothing else in there. If you start putting pozzolanic materials, then maybe it doesn't look as good anymore. And you, you have a hard time getting this blue curve up enough to see something meaningful. It would be too flat. So there, there you would need better insulation. But it shows you here that in any case, uh, with a regular concrete based on mostly important cement, you'd be safe even with a, a setup like this. As I said, it's not so much about performance between the coffee cup setup and the more expensive commercially available equipment. It's, it's not that. It's about the practical use that you do every day to make it easy for you because it's something you do several times a day. Uh, for pretty, pretty much every day, because I want to use calorimetry, it's easily addictive. So you want to make it easy so you don't have to go through cumbersome, repeat, repetitive work every day to massage the data. It has to be pushed up. Okay. So I want to go through a few examples of, uh, of data interpretation so I get to this software. This software is actually a new software that 
uh, works with our new device with this black FCAL 8100 and it's officially released tonight so uh, some users already had it in beta version but uh, tonight we will release that it it will not work with the older equipment and we didn't do that because we want to sell more we did that because they, there was no choice because it was a matter of the old equipment as a different data logger than our newer version and so it was not possible to make the software talk to the old data logger and the new at the same time so we uh this this new software will only work with for those who already have the fcal 8100 i want to go here through a, a few of the the things you can do um, so we have the reports tab which is what you would use to uh, only look at visual interpretation of data and I'm going to put here which is a, a real example from quite a few years ago and I'm going to uh, hide the curse to start with so that's an example of uh, a concrete pour that is just a regular normal mix that has a water reducer in there a little bit of a retarder and some color pigments and uh, the company that uh, was pouring that concrete had made some tests with their regular mix. This was a standard mix that they used with the same water reducer, the same retarder that they already knew. And uh, they assumed that the that the color pigments were in, relatively inert in that case. And when they put it in the field, they got a result that was very bad because the thing wouldn't set. It would take hours and hours and hours, and the concrete was still soft. So I had to go back and do some work. And as we pulled the colorimeter back then. We looked at that and we saw indeed when you have here this uh, this mix as it was poured in the field uh, with the color pigment you would have a very long period before you actually get a start of the reaction you would have the setting time just for the sake of it we're going to look here a little bit about half the height of the of the total height of the curve so we would get be here more or less the setting time would be around 19 hours of course it was unacceptable and so they were scratching their heads of what it was and they said well it's probably the retarder there was a problem with the re retarder as such so they they put the same mix again in the colorimeter but without the retarder and it was yeah it was a little faster but not much better so the conclusion quickly became that the problem was actually the color pigment uh, verify that you will do a control of the normal mix that's the normal mix without color pigment and without retarder the normal mix with color pigment and a little bit of retarder. So something that of course in the colorimeter is obvious and you see with one single test, you see very clearly which part, which component that you added makes a difference and makes it bad. Uh, when you see this in the field, you scratch your head and you say, what could it be? And if you had to do tests of setting time on all of those, uh, you would be hard pressed to find out what's really going on. The fact that you see a continuous curve here and that you see something that you can easily visually compare makes it obvious without the tool it's not as obvious you could say maybe the color pigment has something to do with it but you could not be sure you wouldn't know for how much so that's an example of troubleshooting where just a, a visual assessment of the curves on the screen gives you an immediate answer and it took what it took 24 hours worth of curves you wouldn't even have to run it for 24 hours. You could probably run it for less than that. But just seeing how the curves behave after maybe 18 hours, you would see how what's going on. So that's one example. Uh, moving to another example, uh, we could look at uh, setting times. Setting times is a, an application that is quite often used by many. And the way I want to uh, look at that is as follows. So, as I said earlier, in setting times, you usually use what we call a, a model where you establish uh, the, the fractions method. And this is how it works. To establish a model, you would normally do, uh, you would look for a correlation between physically measured set times, for example, using ASTM C403, so some proctor needle concept. And you would measure that physically for a given mix. And at the same time, you would also put that same sample uh, inside a calorimeter, a semi-adiabatic calorimeter, and get a curve. And then when you're done and you have your physically measured results, you would correlate those results with the curve. So you would, for example, add a curve here, and I, I will take just any curve. Um, so we have it here, so let me just one of those real quick. 
here's a curve, and then you would say, uh, well, whatever physical set time you have, you could correlate this to, to this curve, and uh, you would look at uh, at the time you have that set time. You would look at which temperature was reached. So let's put an example here. Let's say my initial set. I'm making this up because I actually do not have the real values for that. Uh, the example that will still work. I'll say it was at three hours and 50 minutes. I will say that my final set was at five hours. Well, because I, not 50 hours, five hours. Okay. So here I would get those two points, right? So I would get after three hours and 50 minutes and at five hours. And for a given mix, what I would look at is the fraction from the bottom to the top that it took in order to reach that set time. So for example, I had to climb by how much? I had to climb by 70, from 72 degrees here, from the bottom of the curve, to 90 degrees Fahrenheit to reach my, uh, my, early, my initial set. And that's a pro in proportion. It's a certain proportion. It's actually exactly 33% of the total peak. Uh, this climb here to reach the initial set is 33% of my total difference between the bottom of the curve where it started and the top where the peak is, 33%. And each mix has its own fractions. That's what the fractions method is. It's very simple. But each mix has its own fractions, and you, you can use that over and over again. You can change admixtures and things and use the same fractions. You cannot change to a different cement source or different cement content, and it's a different mix. And so knowing that each mix has its fractions, you can calibrate that when you have a few mixes that you use very often standard mixes or things that are very bread and butter mixes, you could calibrate those. And as you switch to different bands of admixtures or switch dosage, you can then use the calorimetry with that model uh, in order to, uh, to determine setting times without doing physical set times each time. So that's how it's used. And that's uh, how it became popular mostly in the beginning with admixture companies that work with standard mixes. Uh, so today, actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to create just what I call a generic model, I'm going to be lazy. And I'm going to say, well, I will just create something that I know works for most of the time. Because having done this for a number of years, I know that good fractions to use is actually just one third and two thirds. So among concrete professionals, there's endless debates of what these right fractions could be. And many people might come and disagree with me and say, no, it should be 50%, 70%. For me, 33 and 66 is sort of the generic one that works almost always so we'll just use this like that i put my fractions here and i will save this model and say i call this the one third two thirds and that is because i've seen it over the years that it works pretty often very well now i'm going to use this model it's my generic model that i can use or whenever I, I didn't do the physical testing and I didn't really have the values to compare to physical proctor needle tests. I'm going to use this on uh, an example here of testing an admixture. But because there's quite a few people today that are actually from admixture companies, and I expected that, I'm not going to uh, point out a specific brand. I'm going to do this actually dosing diet soda in there as retarders. We have this here where we I have a concrete mix with four different diet sodas. As you can see we have um, in the green curve, we have diet Coke. Then in the yellow curve, we have diet Pepsi. In the red curve, we have diet Dr. Pepper. And in the blue curve, we have diet 7-Up. I loaded those curves. I'm going to select my one-third, two-thirds model that I just created. And as you can see on the right-hand side here, it spits out uh, the initial and the final set times. So these values might not be exactly the right ones when you do the, pro the proctor test in parallel. But they will not be off by much. They will be off by five, ten minutes, but they will generally be true. So here I get numerical values for my set times that are good references. Visually, I can already say that the green curve, the Diet Coke, is a better retarder than uh, the red curve, which is a diet Dr. Pepper. I can also say that whatever they put in the diet 7-Up is something that kills the mix completely. It could be a competitor for those, uh, those very strong retardants that you use in reclaimers like the, the Delvo from Master Builders or the Recover from PCP. 
here you can see a flat curve. It means this one is, is dead, it never sets. So as you can see, when you have a software tool that makes it reasonably easy, it's as easy as loading the curve, selecting the model, and then you get good estimates of set time. It tells you where you are, uh, if you are in the range of what you expect or not. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, so one thing to point out uh, for folks uh, online is the what Mark showed you on that, uh, you know, creating a what he called this one third, two thirds generic model. Is that functionality is is new functionality compared to the set program in in the older version of the software? In the older version, you, you really couldn't do it that way. You could fool it by doing a trial and error on the initial TIS and the final TIS to get the fractions that you wanted. But one of the changes on ThermoCal was to allow you to just manually put in the initial set fraction and the final set fraction, in this case 0.33 and 0.66, and easily create a generic model with whatever fractions you want. Okay, so. So generally, the, the set time is, is extremely easy to use, especially with semi-adiabatic calorimetry, and it's one of the most popular uses that people put into this technique. Um, and Mark, uh, before you go yeah. on any further, let me. Uh, there's a couple of questions that came in related to this data right here, so let me ask those, and you can respond to the whole group. So uh, Kevin Luce uh, asks, what dictates creating new fractions? Question mark. Cement source? Question mark. Cement contact? Content question mark ash percentages etc. Yes, it's a uh, it's all of the above. It's everything except admixtures. You can play with admixtures, and uh, you can keep the same fractions. But if you change something in the proportions of your different elements of the cement binders, a uh, proportion between SCM and cement, you change sources around. Uh, if you change uh, a few quanti quantities of things, even if you change actually aggregates. Uh, it's a completely different one, then it has an influence and the fraction would change. Now, in, in the reality, uh, most of the time, instead of looking at absolute values, you look at the differences between those two. And no matter where you place yourself at what fraction you are, if you're here at the bottom or you're here at the top, the, you know, the, the, the difference between here, if you look at the green and the red, for example, is pretty constant along the curves. They go up in parallel because it's the same mix to begin with. So they go up in parallel. So if you really only look at difference between the difference between a control and a uh, and another mix where you varied something by a dosage of admixture or something, you can just go by eyeballing this and you would be spot on. And you, you don't have to go through any pain of fractions. And as I said, uh, the, the one third, two thirds works very well, as does the one half uh three quarters they all work very well why because the curve here is pretty steep and if you change the fraction by a little bit i mean if you change the y value here by a little bit because it's pretty steep the x value will not change by much so your your set time is relatively insensitive to small variations in the fraction and Mark what i'm saying is that when when you're when you're in the field and you do this work and you want a quick result you don't have to be so exact Hey Mark, let me let me uh, just add a couple of things here, um, and maybe this will clear up another question. Several questions here on this. Good questions. It's an important topic. Um, I think the one thing that sometimes confuses people on this is that um, you know this mo this modeling technique. Right, there are two ways to do this. Uh, one is you you are running your physical testing and you're generating the model correlating that particular mix with physical testing from a physical test and theoretically that's the best way to do that and then theoretically that model that you've generated by correlating to the physical testing then you can theoretically you can only change admixtures and so forth for that model to be accurate because it's an empirical model but the, on the other side is this this generic test, you know, where you just, you know, create a model like Mark just did, the one third, two thirds, and you're just making the assumption that the initial set is 0.33 and the final set is 0.66. You're not correlating that 
do any physical testing and you're just going to use that across any sample that you're using for the for the reason that Mark just pointed out, and that is a lot of times what you're really doing is you're looking at differences between sample A and sample B, and you're not necessarily interested in correlating to physical tests and not worrying about the fact that the generic model that you've created, you know, it, it, you're using it maybe with different mixes and, and different, you know, uh, cement sources or whatever, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not theoretically doing it correctly, so to speak, but the reality is, again, if you're comparing sample A to sample B, it doesn't really matter that much. So that's fine. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so let me ask a couple other questions here, Mark, that, that came in. Um, uh, and let me jump down to one that's kind of related to that same. So it says, how does the software calculate the initial and final setting times? What calibration was used? I think that kind of goes to the same topic. I'll let you answer that one. Uh, so the, the calibration that you do is this model precisely. So it's when you have uh, physical values for a given mix weight that you did, like ASTM-C4 with three values, that you did with the proctoneal, and you use those for, for calibration. If you don't have those values, then you can use some, they're not arbitrary fractions. I offer the one third, two thirds. Uh, based on the experience, right? So, and, and these are the ones that I would use if you don't have the time or for whatever reason, you, you don't have the possibility of getting physical calibration data with physical set time testing uh, and to, to calibrate it against the curve. So either you calibrate uh, with that physical data or you use a generic values. And, and that ties into another question from the here that says uh, the ASTM standard calls for initial and final set fractions of 25% and 50%, where I put out 33 and 66. And uh, so, which which ones are right, which ones are wrong? So, the, the 33, 66 comes from uh, years and I want to say thousands of mixes that have been tested while I was at Grace back then. And we test these day in, day out. And the colleague of mine that's also at Calmetrics now, Paul Sandberg, put that on a graph someday. And he said, oh gosh, I mean, this one third, two thirds comes out all the time. There's always the cases of the outliers where you have very strange mixes that are, for example, very high in sulfate and it wouldn't work for rap rapid set cements and things like that. But in, in general, for regular mix, this popped out as really the cluster of values was in one third, two thirds. At the same time, we got like Tim Cost, but old Tim probably did the same. And he, he had, might have had a different type of uh, setup for the calorimeter and he found that it's more closer to 25%, 50%. Is there someone that's right or wrong? I wouldn't say so. It's based on empirical data. Uh, as I said, the difference between 25% for initial set and 33 will not give you a, a whole lot of difference in set time, a few minutes at most. Depends on how, how flat the curve is. But uh, th those those values are they're not completely arbitrary. They're based on, on years of experience, but they're not completely uh, they're not universal either. Hmm? Yeah, and, and, and you know, worth the point out right. that uh, I mean the, the bottom line is that if you're going to do a generic model, whether it's 0.25 and 0.5 or 33 and 60, 66 percent, it's probably more important just to be consistent. Choose a method and stick with it, you know, and and that's what you use, you know, because that'll give you the good basis for compar comparison. Correct. And. Uh... Tom Green is asking, uh, how does the blue curve give a 19 hour set time when it's not setting at all? Uh, that's, that's because of our algorithm in, in the, that we have in the software. We, of course, um, it, it's simple when you eyeball it and, and humans do it, but when you have to teach a machine how to interpret this data, you have to put some parameters in there. For example, when you have, like here you have an initial bump, then you have the other one, so you have to teach your machine to recognize that it shouldn't try to find a setting time here. It should try to find it on the main part of the curve. And so there's certain things in there. And one of those, uh, those safe, safeguards that you have in the system is it says, look, if, the, if for, for some reason the software cannot determine which of those peaks is the right one, it will by default give you for initial and final set the, uh, the, the value that corresponds to the second peak in there. Uh, what, what this means is that when you look at it as a human being, you have to exercise what you what you have and the machine doesn't it's your intelligence and you have to look at it and deduct that ah, this curve is flat there's no setting so it indicates 19 but pretty much in this case it's a junk value something you have to throw out 
comes from the programming, from the criteria we put in there. Okay. So I'll have. Yeah, I think that oh. questions on that, except that, uh, so Jason, uh, yes, you're right. So we all need to drink diet seven up and we'll all not age. So that's, that's correct. That's right. No, no, no diet soda for me. I only take pure sugar and it works as well. But, uh, but in fact, the diet sodas uh, retard more than the pure sugar ones, strangely. So uh, now we can go and we can go and check out an example for the, the set time. So the principle for set times is the same. It actually uses maturity, so equivalent age, strength but time. the principle is the same. Hmm? Uh, sorry, for the strengths, right? So the, it's the same. Um, same approach where you would create a model and that uh, eventually from that model, you would use it to derive, uh, sorry, I'm gonna move something here. So you would use it to derive your estimates of compressive strength. So wh when is that useful? It's useful in particular when you, for example, when you say, well, first of all, before I go even there, it's useful because uh, it's way less cumbersome to use calorimetry to get an estimate of compressive strength than Testing a bunch of tubes or a bunch of cylinders, you have to these two, three for each age, and it's a whole setup, and you have, and uh, you you probably need to have a curing chamber and all sorts of things. So it's uh, way more cost effective and less cumbersome to do calorimetry when you want a quick estimate. But it's also useful when, let's say, it's Friday morning, and you want to you're casting, you're doing some concrete, you're mixing some concrete, and you want to get uh, a, a few samples out to do 24-hour uh, strength. Uh, and 48 hours strength, you, you really don't want to come back on Saturday and on Sunday to, uh, to to break those cubes or break those cylinders and get the value. So if it's Friday, generally what you would do, you would wait until Monday. But in this case, with a calorimeter, you can just mix your concrete, put in the calorimeter and leave for the weekend. And when you come back for the weekend, you can actually pull up those curves. So I'm not going to go through creating the model here because it's it's a bunch of numbers that I have to put in and it takes a solid five minutes and everybody will get bored. And so I already created the model, but it's the same principle. So you you make a, a sample, uh, you you put you put a you put together a mix, and you take samples for the cubes or cylinders at several curing ages. So say 24 hours, 48, and 72, and maybe uh, 36 as well. You you choose a few curing ages, and you you actually do physical testing for those, so three each, as you would usually do in your method, take the average, and at the same time, from the same batch, you would take a sample and put it in the calorimeter and run the curve, and then you would correlate the two. You would, you would get a correlation between the physical values and your calorimetry curve, and that creates a model. And it's the same principle, uh, as long as you don't change around the cement content and the cement source and fly ash source and fly ash content, you can use the same model over and over again, even if you change admixture dosages or admixture types. You have that model with the same mix, or you can go ahead and use it in your calorimeter. So I already created the model. I just wanted to show how, how it works once you, you have the model. So if at a later period in time, I want to pull a mix here, I'm going to take this one that I already had here, and then I have a bunch here. I'm not going to, you, you will take them one by one typically. They're all, some, they're all something different. I'm going to take one here. Like that, and what it displays here is uh, actually your equivalent age curve, right? So it's like the cumulative temperature, but it is not the temperature curve, it's the equivalent age as per the maturity concept. Then you would create your model, which is collected. So I already created this model here uh, and it's displayed on the right hand side and then you can just go ahead and you can say uh i show you so you can just say put the values that you want in here i put 24 hours and i get a, a value of 24 hours an estimate of uh so 1260 psi i could put in there 30 hours just for the fun of it i have a good i get a value of 1770 PSI. So these are all estimates, and I could put any age in there. So uh, uh, unlike with physical compressive strength testing, where you have to be there at the exact time to break the cylinders, uh, and where you cannot go back and say, oh, I wish I had 30 hours uh, data, and I wish I had 36 hours data, with this continuous curve, you can. You can plug in anything, and you can see how it evolves hour by hour, minute by minute. So it gives you estimates for all of that. So I 
whatever curing agent I want, and I get an estimate. The only restriction is that you cannot go beyond the, the measurement of the curve. So if I measure it for 108 hours, it's the maximum estimate I can get. So I cannot predict like a, a seven days trends or something like that. It goes by the curve. I could put here 72 hours, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I would get here the estimate 3,230 PSI. So very easy to use once you have your model. So instead of doing compressive strength testing every time with your standard mixes, you do it once. And, and then you can, uh, you can use colorimetry to get your estimates going forward. Of course, if you have a, to do something official, uh, colorimetry is not the official way if you have to go uh, to some, I don't know, to some, so some issue where you have to, to prove values of compressive strength, you would still do your physical testing. But if it is to get a quick estimate for you to uh, do a little bit of tweaking in a mix design or to prepare for a project, this is the good way to go. And of course, it's good for admixture suppliers too. When they do development of new admixtures, it's also a powerful tool. But that gives you an idea of the kind of things you can do. And the, uh, the advantage of having a software like that that's dedicated and made for it is that it's relatively easy. So it, it's no impediment. You don't have to think, oh, do I really have half an hour to massage my data, to put it in Excel, plot those curves, uh, change all those things? And in this case, it really takes a few minutes, no matter what you do. So with that said, I want to go back to uh, one more slide on the uh, thing where I said, uh, I said before, if you really want to upgrade or if you really want to do something meaningful with your homemade devices and uh, invest on insulation and on, on software. Now, also, if you have some of the old devices, we do take trade-ins because we realize that things go better, get better as we go and that the designs get better. Uh, so uh, I don't want this to be today a commercial presentation at all, but I do want to indicate for those who have the, the stuff you see on the left, the devices that are the uh, previous models of our metrics by by colorimeters or the little bit older gray sadiacal, you can trade those in and uh, get get a sizable discount about a third of the price uh, the normal price. Get a, a newer Calmetrics FPL eighty one hundred and what this newer model gives you is it's a more robust build for field testing. It really is a very robust SKB case and almost indestructible. You have much better insulation, so you get a good signal, better signal, especially for the, the applications where you see more and more puzzlings in those mixes. And then you get a much better data logger and, and also the new ThermoCal new software that's easier to use and overall does everything I think most people would need. And uh, with that, uh, if there are any more questions, we're yeah, very happy to. You were one question from. Uh... From Andy um, about uh, testing rapid setting cement mix mixers CSAs or CACs. Uh, you you can, uh, however, you have to consider that because the temperature is not controlled in this, you you have a big variability from the your lab temperature because it takes a while uh, for your mix temperature to uh, adapt to or to to equilibrate balance out with. The temperature that you have in your device so if the mix temperature is significantly different as per the temperature of the materials right after you mix then uh, you wouldn't see much for at least a solid hour or an hour and a half so if if the rapid set occurs in that time and it usually does and it's hidden in that in that noise so the thing you would do with your semi-adiabatic calorimeter you would try to put it in a temperature controlled room well, the room is well temperature controlled, and you absolutely need to precondition all your materials to uh, the same temperature control room or very close. Otherwise, you won't see much. For rapid set cement, in general, it's actually better to have nice thermal calorimeter because by default, you you have the temperature controlled since the beginning. Hey, Mark, uh, go go back up that slide. I think uh, Ronnie just probably wants to copy some things down, and we will. Just uh, so you know, everyone, I uh, didn't mention at the outset, but um, we recorded this and I'll be sending out a, a link to the recording. But uh, yeah, just to keep it on that slide while we finish up the questions. Mark, there's Ryan was asking about uh, new software reading older 80 account calls. 
Uh, no, it, it doesn't actually. The new, the new, not the old ADACAL files. And the, the new software reads the uh, everything that was ever generated by Calmetric software. ADACAL was a software that, while it looks similar and has been programmed by the same folks in the beginning, it uses different data loggers, different formats, different everything. So in, in it will not read old ADACAL files. Mm, was not possible. Also, a lot of changes in the Windows operating systems it becomes more and more complicated to make those backwards compatible. So if you have an old area call, you're stuck with the old software. And the, the one thing, too, to point out on this slide, uh, switching gears here quickly, yeah, because Ronnie asked the question, I was going to answer it for you. So the, the, the list price on the Calmetrics 8100 uh, with the basic software is $73.95, $7,395. And then whichever system you're trading in, then you, the discounts are shown on the slide there, either $2,700 or $2,100. And then there's uh, the two optional software packages on the FCAL uh, is, is the set time program um, and the and now the new uh, strength program, and both of those uh, are 495. I can't remember, Mark. I think there was a discount on those two packages for the trade-ins as well. Uh, I, I think that uh, the, for for those who had an FCAL uh, 81, 8000, 8, for example, an old FCAL, uh, and already had the software, we, we yeah. would just uh, issue a new license. Right. There would no one, no one would have to pay you again. If someone paid Calmetrics for the software, you wouldn't have to pay again to get this. We wouldn't have to. We wouldn't but, argue for the software again. Yeah, it I think be thrown the, in for free. Yeah, the bottom line is for any of you that that have specific situations, it's probably best just to get in contact with things and we figure out what you got, and we'll we can do a quote for you based on that. So, um, and Jun He was asking. Um, the difference between the set time from adiabatic and semi-adiabatic calorimetry? Well, both use the same method, and it's a method of comparing to uh, physical results. Y you will get uh, the same results uh, with a caveat. In, in isosolar calorimeters, you get, because your temperature is controlled, you get the same exact environment every time. So you have excellent repeatability. You do not have that with a semi-adiabatic calorimeter. If it's hot in the room one day, and it's cold on another day, or if the materials were a different temperature on one day and another day, and you will get slightly different results. And the slightly different can be sometimes 15 to 15%, so it's not always slightly. You would not encounter that issue with isothermal calorimeters. It's just more repeatable, more reliable in, in that respect. If you if you compare results from different days, if it's all on the same day, in the same conditions, you would get as good results in the semi-adiabatic as you get in the isothermal. Yeah, and, and the other thing I just wanted to also thinking about it, just to make sure everyone knows. Um, so if you do have an FCAL, and, and actually, Godwin, appreciate your comment there. If you do have an FCAL 8100 already, if you've got the, the black cased FCAL, you can download the, the new software. That's a free upgrade. So you can do that as soon as Mark gets it posted up on the website. Uh, for those who are using yep. this thing, FCAL, um, you know, the black, the black FCAL, you will, when you install that, you're going to get a second icon out in your desktop for the new Thermocal. It'll still have the Cal Commander icon as well. And you can um, you can open up, you know, any of the data files that you generated on the old software, you can open up in the new software. Just bear in mind that if you generate data with the new software on, you know, on the unit, then you can't you can't go backwards. You can't open up those data files in the uh, in the old software. So it's upgradable from one way, but not obviously down down downward. Uh, um, um, you can't open those files once you've generated in the new software on the old, using the old program. Hopefully that made sense. If you have any questions, you can just get in touch with me. So. Okay, we're gonna. Uh, Mark, any other comments here? Uh, let's see, Yagen. Um, data from the FCAL 8000 and 4000 cannot be compared. Um, so he's just commenting on that, that the, if you have an old. Uh, yeah, that, that's true, because uh, that's an important aspect that Jagan brings up, actually. And you, you can see that uh, he's, he's used it in the field, of course. 
because it's a different quantity. But because of course the signal you get, the total temperature that uh, it gets plotted is a function of two things. It's a function of how reactive your sample is. A more reactive cement will give you more temperature than a less reactive cement. And it's also a function of total quantity of material. So if you have a bunch of material in there, it generates more heat than a little amount of material. So comparing uh, a curve, a test curve, from a, a sample that was in a four by eight cylinder to a curve obtained with a sample in a three by six cylinder, will obviously not be comparing apples to apples. So to be able to compare two curves, you need the same quantity of material in it. And uh, generally speaking, when, when you use this apparatus, no matter which model you use, if it's a coffee cup, if it's two by four cylinders, three by six, four by eight, always use the same amount. So and the easiest way to do that is just fill the sample cylinder all the way to the top. Always fill it fully and then you won't have any issues. And Mark, did you see the question from Jason? I need to see progress on the course area. So uh, it, it's it's better actually when you okay, the question is when using the 8100, do you need to see concrete samples using coarse aggregates, the larger aggregates, to the smaller cylinder size? It it's a it's better to do that because you get uh, more reproducible results. When you have large aggregates like that in there, you, you can have two samples that are filled to the rim of the, the cylinder, both of them, but with different quantities of actual cement paste in there because of the aggregates and how inhomogeneous it is. So if you really want to compare apples to apples, it's, it's a good practice. It's better to see about the large aggregates. That's right. Good questions. Uh, let's see, Gagan. Uh... Comment on using this data to determine saw cutting time. Uh, uh, yes, well, so there's, there's, uh, there is a way of determining saw cutting time. And we actually had in the previous version of the software, we, we had a possibility to do that, where you could determine the saw cutting time without waiting for the main peak. You would look at how quickly the curve uh, takes off, and it would determine uh, the, the right time for saw cutting. So you would also calibrate this for given mixes. Uh, now, we, it's not in a new software, and we can actually put it there again, because there was not much demand, to be honest. The, we, we haven't found many, uh, I should say, almost any people that actually wanted to use it that way. So we didn't find it useful to include it in the new software. But it could always be added, no problem, with it in the old software. So um, it's something that is doable. And again, it's a matter of calibrating physical data from uh, what you can measure uh, for the software time to, to validate it and calibrate it with the perimeter curve. Same concept. Okay, so Mark and I will stay. There's still lots of people online here, so if you have questions, certainly Mark and I will. Uh, We'll stay if you if you're going to leave. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody attending, and uh, please, if you have any specific questions, you know where to where to find us. I will be sending out uh, to everyone the recording.